All right, all you A-Push people, welcome back to the Grand A-Push timeline. This period is going to be the pre-colonization period. It's going to start in 1576. And if you ask why does it start in 1576, well, that's, of course, because of Martin Frobisher. Pause for them to go, who? Never even heard of him. Well, right because Martin Frobisher doesn't even show up in the index of Fraser. He never mentioned him. But this is Mr. Rooney's Grand Day Push timeline. These are these periods according to me. And I say that if we're trying to tell the story of how did the first English colony in what becomes the United States of America get started, that story starts with Martin Frobisher because he's the first English person to come across to the New World and instead of just exploring, actually try to set up a colony. Now, this is technically in Canada, in the Hudson Bay area. The colony doesn't succeed, but he is the first person to try to set up a permanent colony for England. So I say that's the correct beginning of this story. Now, the end of this story, of course, will be 1607. And if you can't remember that 1607 is the date that goes along with the founding of Jamestown, well, then you might need to go back and review period two that we studied back in the fall because even A. Push says that that period goes from 1607 to 1754. So um, if we're telling the story of how did the first permanent English settlement come about, then when it gets settled, that's the end of the period. So what are the events that you need to know from this particular period? Well, I would say that number one, fairly early on, right after Frobisher is Sir Francis Drake. He is technically exploring the west coast of what is today the United States. He's going up the California coast, and then he decides to continue around and circumnavigate the globe. Um, so he's the first English person to do so. That's quite a feat. And as a matter of fact, somebody poking around territory that the Spanish consider theirs and then accomplishing the feat of circumnavigating the globe, that kind of shakes the Spanish awake a little bit, who had been dormant in expanding their new world empire. And they go, hey, wow, we better start moving again. And so this is going to be the beginning of their story for, like, uh, how did their development of New Mexico happen? But uh, that's not part of this grand A-Push timeline. Uh, A-Push has the words U.S. in it. And so we're talking United States. And we're here talking about English people because that is essentially where the period comes from. So what comes next? Well, this is when we get the lost colony of Roanoke. Um, you might remember that, uh, at least if you're in the big half of the class, when we went to take our picture on the stairs, big half and little half, and we all vanished out of this room, maybe a security guard would have shown up to give somebody a pass and go, hey, wait a minute, where did they go? And Tilly left them a little history joke over on the whiteboard right over there that you can't see because it's just off a of camera range by writing Croatoan on the board. Whoa, history joke. But you might remember that's the word that is left, the only remnant of the lost colony of Roanoke when people came back. Um, you might remember Roanoke is also the uh, source of a trivia question that is often asked in U.S. history. Who was the first English person to be born in the New World? There is actually a baby girl born in the Roanoke colony by the name of Virginia Dare, and she therefore gets that particular... Um, uh, designation as the first person of English descent born in the New World. So if you remember the story of the Roanoke colony, um, people had helped set up Roanoke. They went back to England to try to get more stuff and more people to come back, and they couldn't come back for a while. It took a couple of years because this is the time period of the conflict between the English and the Spanish that leads to the defeat of the Spanish Armada by the English. Once all that is taken care of, that's what allows people to come back across the ocean again and catch up with the people at Roanoke only to find that they had all vanished. And so that colony doesn't take root either. Um, it takes a while, it takes real development, it takes the creation of joint stock companies before they're really going to try again and finally give us Jamestown at the end of that period. 
So these really are the events in this very small period called pre-colonization. You might say, if it's this small, why do we care? Well, what are you going to do for your um, uh, contextualization if you get a long essay question or a DBQ that somehow or another relates to Jamestown? How are you going to contextualize that without a pre-colonization story? But you're right, this is a short one and we can basically move on. So we're going to finish this one with a preview of what we're going to call the colonial period. This is what the College Board called period two from 1607 to 17. 54, they said, but I say 1763. I think that's the, the, the better ending period when the French and Indian War ends, and I'll make that argument when we get to the end of that period. But the reason I bring this up is, is as a preview, we're going to be breaking this period up into three different periods. We're going to call the early colonial period separate from the middle colonial period and call that separate from the late colonial period because that time span of years is just way too big to, to bite off in just one mouthful. Um, we're going to take each of these particular periods and give you a screen for each of them. We'll have a period called the early colonial period, the middle colonial period, and the late colonial period. That's what's coming next in the next installment of the Grand A-Push Timeline.